Welcome back to the haunting hour, the home where shadows whisper and the unseen lurks in every corner. If this video sends a shiver down your spine, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe for more chilling tales, and ring the bell to never miss an eerie episode. I'm eager to hear from you, so after the video, comment below to tell me which story you like the most and what haunting tales you'd like to hear next. Now gather your courage because it's time to dive into the first story. Let's see if you can handle the haunting. It was supposed to be an epic weekend. My friends and I had been planning this camping trip for months. School was out and we were all looking forward to a few days of hiking, fishing, and just hanging out around the campfire. We'd found this spot in the middle of nowhere, a forgotten campground that Jake's older brother had told us about. It wasn't on any maps, and that made it even more appealing. Jake, Max, Sarah, and I piled into Jake's old SUV and hit the road early on a Friday morning. The sun was shining, and the radio was blasting our favorite tunes. We drove for hours, finally turning off onto a narrow dirt road that wound its way through dense woods. It was bumpy and overgrown, but Jake swore he knew the way. Trust me, guys, Jake said, glancing over his shoulder with a grin. This place is amazing. Totally worth it. I hope so, Sarah replied, her voice tinged with doubt. We've been driving forever. Almost there, Jake promised. We finally arrived at the campground just as the sun was starting to set. It was as secluded as Jake had said. No signs, no other campers, just a few old fire pits and a small clearing surrounded by towering pine trees. We set up our tents and started a fire, feeling like we had the whole forest to ourselves. This place is awesome, Max said, tossing another log onto the fire. Good find, Jake. Told you, Jake replied, smirking. Let's get some hot dogs going. I'm starving. We roasted hot dogs and marshmallows, laughing and telling stories as the stars began to twinkle overhead. It felt like the perfect start to our trip. But as the night wore on, a strange feeling settled over me. I couldn't shake the sense that we were being watched. You guys hear that? I asked, glancing around the dark forest. Hear what? Max replied, his mouth full of marshmallow. I don't know. Just thought I heard something. Probably just the wind, Jake said, waving it off. Relax, man. We're in the middle of nowhere. Nothing out here but us and the trees. But I couldn't relax. The feeling of being watched only grew stronger. I kept scanning the trees, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever it was. Finally, I decided to call it a night. I'm gonna hit the sack, I said, standing up and stretching. Long day. Yeah, me too, Sarah agreed. I'm beat. We all headed to our tents, the fire crackling softly behind us. I climbed into my sleeping bag and closed my eyes, but sleep wouldn't come. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made my heart race. I kept telling myself it was just the wind, just animals, but it didn't help. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange sound. It was faint at first, like a low whisper, but it gradually grew louder. It sounded like someone, or something, was moving around outside the tents. I held my breath, straining to listen. Guys, I whispered, trying not to sound scared. You awake? There was no answer. I unzipped my tent just enough to peek out. The fire had died down to glowing embers, casting an eerie light across the clearing. I couldn't see anything unusual, but the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. I was about to zip my tent back up when I saw it, a shadow moving between the trees. It was quick, darting out of sight as soon as I focused on it. My heart pounded in my chest. 
I knew I wasn't imagining things. I crawled out of my tent as quietly as possible and crept over to Jake's tent. Jake, wake up! I hissed, shaking his shoulder. What's wrong? He mumbled, rubbing his eyes. There's something out there, I whispered. I saw a shadow. Jake sat up, looking more alert. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. It was moving around out there. Jake grabbed a flashlight and we stepped out of his tent. He shined the light around the clearing, but there was nothing there. Everything was still and silent. Probably just an animal, Jake said, but I could tell he wasn't convinced. Maybe, I replied, still scanning the trees. Let's just keep an eye out. We stood there for a while, listening to the sounds of the forest. Eventually, Jake yawned and headed back to his tent. Try to get some sleep, man, he said. We've got a big day tomorrow. I nodded and went back to my tent, but sleep was the last thing on my mind. I lay there, staring at the ceiling of the tent, every sense on high alert. The whispers seemed to come and go, and I could have sworn I heard footsteps circling our campsite. Morning couldn't come fast enough. When the first light of dawn finally broke through the trees, I felt a wave of relief. I crawled out of my tent, eager to see my friends and talk about what had happened. Morning, Max said, yawning and stretching. Sleep okay? Not really, I admitted. Something was out there last night. I'm sure of it. Sarah emerged from her tent, looking equally tired. I heard something too, she said. I thought it was just my imagination. Jake joined us, looking serious. I heard it too. We need to be careful. We don't know what's out here. We decided to stick together and explore the area around the campsite. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the feeling of unease only grew stronger. The trees seemed to close in around us, and the shadows felt darker, more threatening. Guys, look at this, Max said, pointing to the ground. We gathered around and saw what he was pointing at. Footprints. They were fresh and led deeper into the forest. Those aren't ours, Jake said, his voice tense. Someone else is out here. We followed the footprints, moving cautiously. The trail led us to a small, overgrown clearing with an old, dilapidated cabin in the center. The windows were boarded up, and the door hung crooked on its hinges. This place gives me the creeps, Sarah whispered. Me too, I agreed. Let's check it out. We approached the cabin, every step feeling heavier than the last. The air was thick with tension, and the silence was almost oppressive. Jake pushed the door open, and it creaked loudly in protest. Inside, the cabin was dark and musty, filled with old, broken furniture and decaying wood. There were more of those strange symbols carved into the walls, and I felt a chill run down my spine. What is this place? Max asked, his voice echoing in the small space. I don't know, Jake replied, but it doesn't look like anyone's been here for a long time. As we explored the cabin, I noticed a small trapdoor in the floor. It was partially hidden under a rotting rug. I pointed it out to the others, and we gathered around it. Should we open it? Sarah asked, her voice trembling. We have to, Jake said, gripping the edge of the trapdoor. He pulled it open, revealing a dark, narrow staircase leading down into the earth. A foul smell wafted up, making us all recoil. Ugh, that's disgusting, Max said, covering his nose. We need to see what's down there, Jake said, grabbing his flashlight. We descended the stairs, the air growing colder with each step. At the bottom, we found a small underground room. The walls were lined with shelves filled with old jars and bottles, and in the center of the room was a large wooden table covered in dust. This is so creepy, Sarah whispered, her eyes wide. Look at this, Jake said, pointing to a book on the table. 
It was an old leather-bound book, with more of those strange symbols on the cover. Jake opened it, and we gathered around to read the faded, handwritten pages. It was a journal, filled with entries about dark rituals and summoning spirits. This is insane, I said, feeling a knot of fear in my stomach. We need to get out of here. Just then, we heard a noise from above. Footsteps, slow and deliberate, echoing through the cabin. We froze, listening intently. The footsteps grew louder, closer. Someone's up there, Max whispered, his face pale. We need to hide, Jake said, his voice urgent. We scrambled to find hiding spots in the small room. I squeezed behind a shelf, my heart pounding in my chest. The footsteps reached the top of the stairs, and I held my breath. The person descended the stairs, their steps heavy and deliberate. I could see their shadow moving on the wall, but I couldn't make out any details. They reached the bottom and stopped, the silence stretching out painfully. I peeked out from my hiding spot and saw a tall figure dressed in dark, tattered clothing. Their face was hidden by a hood, and they were holding a large, rusty knife. I felt a surge of panic and tried to stay as still as possible. The figure moved to the table and picked up the book, flipping through the pages. They muttered something under their breath, then placed the book back on the table. They turned and started to ascend the stairs, their footsteps fading away. We waited until we were sure they were gone then emerge from our hiding spots, our hearts still racing. We need to get out of here, Jake said, his voice shaky. Now. We hurried up the stairs and out of the cabin, not stopping until we reached our campsite. We quickly packed up our gear, our nerves on edge. As we drove away from the campground, the tension slowly began to fade. We didn't speak much, each of us lost in our own thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had narrowly escaped something truly dangerous. When we got back to town, we decided to report what had happened to the police. They took our statements seriously and promised to investigate the area. We never heard back about what they found, but I knew we had made the right decision. The camping trip that was supposed to be an epic weekend turned into a nightmare we would never forget. It was a reminder that sometimes, the things we can't explain are the things that need our attention the most, and that some places are better left undisturbed. It was supposed to be the best weekend ever. My friends and I had planned this camping trip for weeks, and we were all looking forward to a break from school and a chance to explore the great outdoors. We were going to a place none of us had ever been before. A remote campsite deep in the woods that Matt's older brother had told us about. It wasn't on any official map, which made it even more appealing. There were four of us, Matt, the adventurous one, Jess, who loved anything to do with nature, Sam, the jokester, and me, Alex, just happy to be out with my friends. We packed up Matt's dad's SUV with all the gear we'd need. Tents, sleeping bags, food, and of course, marshmallows for s'mores. The drive out was long and winding, taking us further from civilization with each mile. We finally turned off the main road onto a narrow, overgrown path that Matt assured us led to the campsite. The SUV bounced over rocks and roots as we made our way deeper into the forest. The trees grew taller and denser, blocking out the sunlight. Are you sure this is the right way? Jess asked, peering out the window. Yeah, my brother said it's just a bit off the beaten path, Matt replied confidently. I hope so, Sam said, making a face. We've been driving forever. Eventually we arrived at a small clearing surrounded by towering pines. It was perfect. We set up our tents and got a fire going as the sun began to set. The air was cool and crisp, and the sky was a brilliant orange and pink. We sat around the fire, roasting hot dogs and marshmallows, and telling ghost stories. It was exactly what we had imagined. 
As the night wore on, the woods around us grew darker and more silent. The fire crackled, and the stars appeared overhead, twinkling in the clear night sky. We were all laughing at one of Sam's jokes when we heard a noise, a rustling in the bushes just beyond the light of the fire. Did you hear that? Jess asked, her eyes wide. Probably just an animal, Matt said, trying to sound nonchalant. There's lots of wildlife out here. But the rustling continued, getting louder and closer. I shine my flashlight into the trees, but all I could see were shadows. Maybe we should check it out, I suggested, trying to keep my voice steady. Good idea, Sam said, grabbing a stick from the fire for a makeshift torch. We walked toward the noise, our flashlights and Sam's torch cutting through the darkness. The rustling stopped suddenly, and the woods were eerily silent. We stood there listening, our breaths visible in the cool night air. Hello? Matt called out. Anyone there? There was no response. We waited a few more minutes before deciding to head back to the fire. Probably just a deer or something, Matt said but I could tell he was trying to convince himself as much as us. We sat back down around the fire, but the mood had changed. The shadows seemed darker, and every little sound made us jump. After a while, we decided to call it a night. We put out the fire, and each retreated to our tents. I lay in my sleeping bag, staring at the tent ceiling, unable to sleep. The sounds of the forest seemed louder now, every rustle and creak amplified. I was just starting to drift off when I heard it again. The rustling. Closer this time. My heart pounded in my chest as I listened, trying to figure out what it was. Alex? You awake? Jess's voice came from the tent next to mine. Yeah. I whispered back. You hear it too? Yeah. What do you think it is? I don't know. Probably just an animal, like Matt said. Maybe we should check again. I unzipped my tent and crawled out, flashlight in hand. Jess did the same. We walked over to Matt and Sam's tents and woke them up. There's that noise again, I said. We need to check it out. Matt groaned, but agreed to come with us. Sam grabbed his stick torch, and we headed back into the woods. The rustling grew louder as we approached and my heart raced. We reached the edge of the clearing and shined our flashlights into the trees. That's when we saw it. A figure standing just beyond the light, its eyes reflecting the beam. It was tall and thin, with long, stringy hair and tattered clothes. It looked like something out of a nightmare. What the hell is that? Sam whispered, his voice trembling. Who are you? Matt called out trying to sound brave. The figure didn't move or respond. It just stood there, staring at us. The rustling grew louder, and suddenly the figure turned and disappeared into the trees. Let's get out of here, Jess said, her voice shaking. We ran back to the campsite, our hearts pounding. Once we were back in the clearing, we tried to make sense of what we had seen. Maybe it was just some crazy person living out here, Matt suggested though he didn't sound convinced. Or a ghost, Sam said, half joking. Whatever it was, we need to be careful, I said. Let's stick together and keep the fire going all night. We rebuilt the fire and sat around it, our eyes darting to the trees every few seconds. The feeling of being watched was overwhelming. Every rustle, every snap of a twig set us on edge. Hours passed and the figure didn't return. We finally started to relax a bit, thinking maybe it had just been our imaginations. But just as dawn was breaking, we heard the rustling again, this time all around us. There's more than one, Jess whispered, her face pale. We grabbed our gear and decided to leave the campsite. We couldn't stay here any longer. As we packed up, the rustling grew louder, 
and we saw more figures moving through the trees. They were all tall and thin, with the same stringy hair and tattered clothes. Hurry up, Matt shouted, throwing his bag into the SUV. We piled into the car and sped down the dirt road, the figures fading into the distance. We didn't stop until we reached the main road, our hearts still racing. What were those things? Sam asked, his voice shaking. I don't know, I replied, staring out the window. But I'm glad we got out of there. We never found out what those figures were or why they were there. We told Matt's brother about our experience, and he was shocked. He had camped there before and never seen anything like it. The memory of that weekend stayed with us, a reminder that some places are best left undisturbed. We never went back to that campsite, and we never spoke of it again. But every now and then, I think about those figures in the woods and wonder what they were, and if they're still out there, watching and waiting for their next visitors. I've always loved camping. The thrill of the wilderness, the crackling campfire, and the whispering trees have always been a source of excitement for me. This story, however, is one I never thought I'd have to tell. It's about a night at Raven's Creek, a place that will forever haunt my memories. It was the summer after my freshman year of high school. My friends, Jack, Emily, and I had decided to go on a camping trip to celebrate the start of our summer break. We chose Raven's Creek, a secluded spot deep in the woods, far from the noise of the city. Little did we know, our adventure would turn into a nightmare we would never forget. We arrived at Raven's Creek late in the afternoon. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows through the dense forest. The creek itself was a narrow, winding stream, with water so clear you could see the pebbles on the bottom. We set up our tents near the water, excited for the days ahead. As darkness fell, we gathered around the campfire, roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. Jack, always the Joker, told a silly ghost story about a haunted outhouse that made us laugh. Emily, the more serious one, rolled her eyes but couldn't help smiling. All right guys, I said, trying to sound spooky. I've got a real story for you. Did you know that Raven's Creek is said to be haunted? Jack and Emily looked at me with wide eyes, their laughter fading. Haunted? By what? Jack asked, leaning in closer. There's a legend, I continued, about a girl named Lily who disappeared here over 50 years ago. They say she drowned in the creek, and her spirit still wanders the woods, looking for her way home. Emily shivered and wrapped her arms around herself. That's creepy, she said softly. Just as I was about to continue, we heard a rustling in the bushes behind us. We all froze, our eyes darting towards the sound. The fire crackled, and for a moment, we could hear nothing but our own breathing. It's probably just an animal, Jack said, trying to sound brave but failing miserably. Let's get some sleep. We've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. Reluctantly, we put out the fire and retreated to our tents. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, but I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination. The next morning, we woke up to find our campsite in disarray. Our food supplies had been rummaged through and our backpacks were scattered around the clearing. Who did this? Emily asked, her voice trembling. Maybe it was a raccoon, Jack suggested, though he didn't sound convinced. We spent the day hiking and exploring the area, trying to put the strange incident behind us, but as the sun began to set again, the eerie feeling returned. That night we decided to stay up late, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever had disturbed our campsite. We sat by the fire, talking in hushed tones, our eyes scanning the darkness. Around midnight, we heard it again, 
a rustling in the bushes, closer this time. My heart pounded in my chest as I grabbed a flashlight and aimed it towards the sound. Who's there? I called out, my voice shaking. For a moment, there was silence. Then we heard a faint, ghostly whisper. Help me! Emily gasped and clutched Jack's arm. Did you hear that? She whispered. Yeah, Jack replied, his face pale. But where did it come from? I shined the flashlight around, but there was nothing, just trees and shadows. We decided to keep the fire burning all night and take turns keeping watch. None of us got much sleep. The next day, we were exhausted, but determined to figure out what was going on. We spent the morning searching the area, looking for any signs of intruders or animals. We found nothing. As night fell, we gathered around the fire again, our nerves on edge. We talked about leaving, but none of us wanted to be the first to suggest it. We didn't want to admit we were scared. Around midnight, the rustling started again. This time, it was accompanied by a faint, mournful wail. Help me! I stood up, my heart racing. We need to find out what's making that noise, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. Jack and Emily nodded, and we grabbed our flashlights. We moved towards the sound, our footsteps crunching on the forest floor. Help me! The voice was louder now, coming from the direction of the creek. We reached the water's edge, our flashlights sweeping the area. And then we saw her. A ghostly figure, standing in the shallow water, her long hair dripping wet, and her eyes wide with sorrow. Lily? I whispered, my voice barely audible. The figure nodded slowly. I can't find my way home, she said, her voice echoing through the night. Emily gasped and took a step back. What do you want from us? she asked, her voice shaking. Help me find my way home, the ghostly figure repeated. We stood there, frozen in fear, not knowing what to do. Finally, Jack spoke up. How can we help you? Lily pointed towards the forest. Follow the path, you'll find a way. We exchanged nervous glances, but knew we had to help. We followed the direction she pointed, our flashlights casting eerie shadows on the trees. The path was narrow and winding, and the deeper we went, the colder it got. I could see my breath in the air, even though it was summer. After what felt like an eternity, we reached a clearing. In the center was an old, dilapidated cabin. The windows were broken, and the door hung off its hinges. This must be it, I said, my voice barely a whisper. We approached the cabin, our hearts pounding. As we stepped inside, the temperature dropped even further. The air was thick with the smell of decay. Help me! The voice was coming from upstairs. We climbed the rickety staircase, each step creaking ominously. At the top, we found a small room with a single window. In the corner was a dusty old trunk. Open it. Lily's voice whispered. With trembling hands, Jack opened the trunk. Inside, we found a collection of old, faded photographs and a locket. The locket had a picture of a young girl, Lily. Take it to the creek, the voice instructed. We took the locket and made our way back to the water. As we approached the creek, Lily's ghostly figure appeared again. Thank you, she said. Her voice filled with relief. Now I can find my way home. We placed the locket in the water, and as it sank, Lily's figure began to fade. Goodbye, she whispered, and then she was gone. The next morning, we packed up our campsite and left Ravens Creek. None of us spoke much on the way home, each lost in our own thoughts. Years have passed since that night, but I still think about Lily. I hope she found her way home, and I hope her spirit is finally at peace.
Camping at Raven's Creek changed us. We went there looking for adventure, and we found something far more haunting. It's a story we rarely share, but one that will stay with us forever. And so, as I sit here telling you this story, I can only hope that you never find yourself at Raven's Creek, listening to the whispers of a lost soul. Because some places are haunted not by ghosts, but by the memories they leave behind. I never imagined that a simple camping trip could turn into a terrifying ordeal. It was supposed to be a fun weekend getaway with my friends, Max and Lisa, but what we encountered in Hollow Oak Forest was far beyond anything we could have imagined. We arrived at Hollow Oak Forest on a bright Friday afternoon. The sun was shining and the birds were singing as we hiked deep into the woods to find the perfect camping spot. The forest was dense with towering oaks, their branches forming a thick canopy overhead. It was beautiful, but there was something unsettling about the silence that seemed to hang in the air. We set up our tents near an old gnarled oak tree that looked like it had been there for centuries. Max, always the adventurous one, suggested we explore a bit before nightfall. Lisa and I agreed and we set off down a narrow, winding trail that led further into the forest. As dusk fell, we returned to our campsite and built a fire. The flickering flames cast eerie shadows on the trees around us. We sat in a circle, roasting marshmallows and telling stories. Max, always the prankster, started with a silly tale about a monster made of marshmallows. All right, all right. Lisa said, rolling her eyes. I've got a real story for you. Have you heard about the ghost of Hollow Oak Forest? Max and I exchanged curious glances. No, what's the story? I asked, leaning in closer. Lisa's expression grew serious. They say that years ago, a young woman named Eleanor disappeared in this forest. She was on a camping trip, just like us, and was never seen again. Some people believe her spirit still roams the woods, searching for a way out. Max chuckled, trying to lighten the mood. Sounds like just another campfire story to me. But as the night wore on and the fire began to die down, we heard a faint, almost imperceptible sound. It was a soft humming, coming from somewhere deep within the forest. We looked at each other, our earlier bravado fading. Did you hear that? Lisa whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Max nodded, his usual confidence gone. Yeah, what do you think it is? The next morning, we woke up to find strange symbols drawn in the dirt around our campsite. They looked like circles with intricate patterns inside them, unlike anything we'd ever seen before. This is getting weird, I said, my voice trembling. Who would do this? Lisa shook her head. I don't know, but I don't like it. We decided to spend the day hiking and trying to enjoy ourselves, but the eerie feeling from the night before lingered. Everywhere we went, it felt like we were being watched. The forest, which had seemed so inviting before, now felt menacing. That night, we built the fire higher and sat closer together. We tried to laugh and tell jokes, but the atmosphere was heavy with tension. Around midnight, the humming started again, louder this time. I think we should leave, Lisa said, her voice barely audible. This place isn't right. Max and I nodded in agreement, but as we began to gather our things, we heard a soft, plaintive voice. Help me. We froze, our eyes darting towards the sound. It was coming from the direction of the old oak tree. With our flashlights in hand, we cautiously approached the tree. The voice grew louder, and we saw a faint, ghostly figure standing near the base of the tree. She was dressed in old-fashioned clothing, and her eyes were filled with sorrow. Eleanor, Lisa whispered her voice shaking. The figure nodded. 
I can't find my way out. Please help me. Max swallowed hard. How can we help you? Eleanor pointed towards the heart of the forest. There's a place, a clearing, where I disappeared. Take me there, and I can find my way home. We exchanged nervous glances, but knew we couldn't leave her like this. We followed her through the dark forest, the trees looming like silent sentinels. The air grew colder the deeper we went, and a thick fog began to form around us. After what felt like hours, we reached a small clearing. In the center was a stone altar, covered in moss and vines. Eleanor's figure stood by the altar, her eyes pleading. Place your hands on the stone, she instructed, and speak my name. With trembling hands, we did as she asked. Eleanor, we said in unison. The air around us shimmered, and for a moment we saw a flash of light. When it faded, Eleanor was gone, and the forest felt different, lighter somehow, as if a great burden had been lifted. We made our way back to the campsite in silence, too stunned to speak. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we packed up our things and left Hollow Oak Forest, eager to put the experience behind us. In the days and weeks that followed, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We searched for any information about Eleanor and the symbols we had seen, but found nothing definitive. It was as if the forest had swallowed up the past and only released a whisper of its secrets. Years later, the memory of that night still lingers. We rarely talk about it, but when we do, we can't help but wonder what truly happened in those dark woods. Did we help a lost soul find peace, or was it all just a strange dream? One thing is certain. Hollow Oak Forest is a place we will never return to. The whispers of the past are best left undisturbed, for some secrets are too haunting to be forgotten. It was the summer before my sophomore year of high school when my friends, Daniel and Chloe and I, decided to go camping at Shadow Lake. The lake was nestled deep within a dense forest, a few hours drive from our hometown. Known for its pristine waters and serene environment, Shadow Lake was the perfect escape from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Little did we know, this seemingly tranquil place harbored a dark secret. We arrived at Shadow Lake on a warm Friday afternoon, our spirits high and our backpacks filled with camping gear and snacks. The lake was stunning, with crystal clear water reflecting the surrounding trees like a mirror. We quickly found a nice spot by the shore, set up our tents, and gathered wood for a campfire. Daniel, always the outdoorsy type, suggested we go for a swim before the sunset. Chloe and I agreed, and soon we were splashing around in the cool, refreshing water. As we swam, I couldn't help but notice how quiet the place was. Almost too quiet. There were no birds chirping, no insects buzzing, just an eerie stillness. As night fell, we built a campfire and sat around it, roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. The flickering flames cast dancing shadows on the trees around us, creating an almost magical atmosphere. Daniel, ever the storyteller, started with a humorous tale about a bear who loved peanut butter. All right, enough of the funny stuff. Chloe said with a grin. Let's hear a real ghost story. I bet you don't know the legend of Shadow Lake. Daniel and I leaned in, intrigued. No, we don't. What's the legend? I asked. Chloe's expression grew serious. They say that many years ago, a young boy named Tommy drowned in this lake. His family was camping here just like us when he disappeared one night. Some people believe his spirit still haunts the lake searching for his family. A chill ran down my spine. That's creepy, I said, glancing nervously at the dark water. Daniel chuckled, trying to lighten the mood. Just a story, right? Nothing to worry about. But as the night wore on and the fire began to die down, 
we heard a soft splash in the water. We looked at each other, our earlier bravado fading. Did you hear that? Chloe whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Daniel nodded, his usual confidence gone. Yeah, what do you think it is? The next morning, we woke up to find strange footprints leading from the lake to our campsite. They were small, like those of a child, and they stopped abruptly near our tents. This is really weird, I said, my voice trembling. Who would do this? Chloe shook her head. I don't know, but I don't like it. We decided to spend the day exploring the forest around the lake, hoping to find some clues or explanations for the strange footprints. As we hiked, the feeling of being watched grew stronger, and the forest, which had seemed so inviting before, now felt oppressive and menacing. That night, we built the fire higher and sat closer together. We tried to laugh and tell jokes, but the eerie atmosphere made it difficult to relax. Around midnight, we heard the splash again, louder this time. I think we should leave. Chloe said, her voice barely audible. This place isn't right. Daniel and I nodded in agreement, but as we began to gather our things, we heard a soft, plaintive voice. Help me. We froze, our eyes darting towards the sound. It was coming from the direction of the lake. With our flashlights in hand, we cautiously approached the shore. The voice grew louder and we saw a faint, ghostly figure standing knee-deep in the water. It was a young boy, his eyes filled with sadness. Tommy? Chloe whispered, her voice shaking. The figure nodded. I can't find my family. Please help me. Daniel swallowed hard. How can we help you? Tommy pointed towards a small island in the middle of the lake. Take me there. It's where I was last with them. We exchanged nervous glances, but knew we couldn't leave him like this. We found a small rowboat nearby, and paddled out to the island. The water eerily calm around us. The fog began to roll in, making it difficult to see more than a few feet ahead. As we reached the island, Tommy's figure stood by the shore, his eyes pleading. There's a place. A cave. Inside, you'll find a lantern. Light it, and I'll find my way home. With trembling hands, we followed him to a small cave on the island. Inside, we found an old lantern covered in cobwebs. We lit it, and the flame flickered to life, casting a warm glow in the darkness. Tommy's figure began to fade, a look of peace washing over his face. Thank you, he whispered, and then he was gone. We made our way back to the campsite in silence, too stunned to speak. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we packed up our things and left Shadow Lake, eager to put the experience behind us. In the days and weeks that followed, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We searched for any information about Tommy and the legend of Shadow Lake, but found nothing definitive. It was as if the lake had swallowed up the past and only released a whisper of its secrets. Years later, the memory of that night still lingers. We rarely talk about it, but when we do, we can't help but wonder what truly happened in those dark waters. Did we help a lost soul find peace? Or was it all just a strange dream? One thing is certain. Shadow Lake is a place we will never return to. The whispers of the past are best left undisturbed, for some secrets are too haunting to be forgotten. Camping has always been my favorite way to spend summer vacations. This year, my friends Alex, Mia, and I decided to venture into Timber Ridge, a dense forest known for its towering pines and scenic trails. We had heard rumors about strange occurrences in the area, but we brushed them off as mere campfire stories. Little did we know, we were in for an experience that would chill us to the bone. 
We arrived at Timber Ridge late in the afternoon. The forest was alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves creating a peaceful atmosphere. We set up our tents in a small clearing near a babbling brook and gathered wood for a campfire. As the sun began to set, the forest grew quieter, almost too quiet. Let's get this fire going, Alex said, striking a match. Soon the flames were crackling and we sat around the fire, roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. This place is perfect, Mia said, smiling. So peaceful. I nodded, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I chalked it up to my imagination and tried to enjoy the evening. As darkness fell, we shared stories and laughed, the fire casting flickering shadows on the surrounding trees. Alex, ever the prankster, told a ridiculous story about a ghostly lumberjack that made us all laugh. All right, enough of that, Mia said, still giggling. I've got a real story for you. Ever heard about the curse of Timber Ridge? Alex and I exchanged curious glances. No, what's the story? I asked. Mia's expression grew serious. They say that a long time ago, a group of loggers went missing in these woods. They had angered the spirits of the forest by cutting down sacred trees, and those spirits cursed them. Their souls are said to wander Timber Ridge, looking for revenge. A chill ran down my spine. That's creepy, I said, glancing around nervously. Alex shrugged, trying to sound brave. Just a story, right? Nothing to worry about. But as the night wore on and the fire began to die down, we heard a distant, mournful wail. We looked at each other, our earlier bravado fading. Did you hear that? Mia whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Alex nodded, his usual confidence gone. Yeah. What do you think it is? The next morning we woke up to find strange carvings on the trees around our campsite. They were intricate symbols, unlike anything we'd ever seen before. This is really weird, I said, my voice trembling. Who would do this? Mia shook her head. I don't know, but I don't like it. We decided to spend the day hiking, hoping to shake off the unease from the night before. As we explored the forest, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. The beauty of Timber Ridge now felt sinister and foreboding. That night we built the fire higher and sat closer together. We tried to laugh and tell jokes, but the eerie atmosphere made it difficult to relax. Around midnight we heard the wail again, louder this time. I think we should leave, Mia said, her voice barely audible. This place isn't right. Alex and I nodded in agreement. But as we began to gather our things, we heard a soft, rustling sound. It was coming from the direction of the brook. With our flashlights in hand, we cautiously approached the brook. The rustling grew louder, and we saw a faint, ghostly figure standing by the water. It was a man dressed in old-fashioned logger's clothes, his eyes filled with sorrow and anger. Who are you? Alex asked, his voice shaking. The figure's eyes bore into us. I am one of the cursed. My name is Elias. We angered the spirits of this forest, and now we are doomed to wander it forever. Mia swallowed hard. How can we help you? Elias pointed to a large ancient tree with a twisted trunk. There is a talisman buried beneath that tree. It holds the power to lift the curse. Find it and bring it to me. We exchanged nervous glances, but knew we couldn't leave him like this. With shovels from our camping gear, we dug beneath the tree. The ground was tough, and it took us what felt like hours, but eventually, we unearthed an old, weathered box. Inside the box was a small, carved stone with strange symbols etched into it. We brought it to Elias, who took it with trembling hands. Thank you, he whispered, tears streaming down his ghostly face. The curse is lifted. As he spoke, 
His figure began to fade, and the forest around us seemed to come alive with a newfound energy. The oppressive feeling lifted, replaced by a sense of peace. We made our way back to the campsite in silence, too stunned to speak. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we packed up our things and left Timber Ridge, eager to put the experience behind us. In the days and weeks that followed, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We searched for any information about Elias and the curse of Timber Ridge, but found nothing definitive. It was as if the forest had swallowed up the past and only released a whisper of its secrets. Years later, the memory of that night still lingers. We rarely talk about it, but when we do, we can't help but wonder what truly happened in those dark woods. Did we help lost souls find peace? Or was it all just a strange dream? One thing is certain. Timber Ridge is a place we will never return to. The whispers of the past are best left undisturbed, for some secrets are too haunting to be forgotten. It was the summer before my junior year of high school when my friends Kevin, Sarah, and I decided to go on a camping trip to Whispering Pines. We had heard about its scenic beauty and tranquil environment, making it the perfect spot for a weekend getaway. However, what we encountered was far from the peaceful retreat we had imagined. We arrived at Whispering Pines in the late afternoon, our spirits high as we set up our tents near a small clearing by a stream. The pine trees towered over us, their branches swaying gently in the breeze, creating a constant whispering sound that gave the forest its name. Despite the serene setting, there was something oddly unnerving about the constant whispering of the trees. After setting up camp, Kevin suggested we explore the area before nightfall. Sarah and I agreed, and we set off down a well-worn trail that led deeper into the forest. The air was fresh, and the sunlight filtered through the dense canopy, creating a mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor. As dusk fell, we returned to our campsite and built a fire. The crackling flames provided warmth and light as we sat around roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. Kevin, ever the Joker, told a ridiculous story about a ghostly lumberjack that made us all laugh. All right, enough with the jokes, Sarah said, still giggling. Let's hear a real ghost story. Have you heard about the Phantom of Whispering Pines? Kevin and I exchanged curious glances. No, what's the story? I asked. Sarah's expression grew serious. They say that many years ago, a young woman named Abigail disappeared in these woods. She was last seen near Whispering Pines, and her spirit is said to haunt the forest, searching for her lost love who never returned from the war. A chill ran down my spine. That's creepy, I said, glancing around nervously. Kevin shrugged, trying to sound brave. Just a story, right? Nothing to worry about. But as the night wore on and the fire began to die down, we heard a soft, mournful melody. It sounded like someone humming a sad tune, and it was coming from the direction of the stream. Did you hear that? Sarah whispered her eyes wide with fear. Kevin nodded, his usual confidence gone. Yeah, what do you think it is? The next morning, we woke up to find strange symbols carved into the trees around our campsite. They were intricate patterns that looked almost like ancient runes. This is really weird, I said, my voice trembling. Who would do this? Sarah shook her head. I don't know, but I don't like it. We decided to spend the day hiking, hoping to distract ourselves from the unsettling carvings. As we explored the forest, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. The beauty of whispering pines now felt eerie and foreboding. That night, we built the fire higher and sat closer together. We tried to laugh and tell jokes, but the eerie atmosphere made it difficult to relax. Around midnight, we heard the humming again, louder this time. I think we should leave, 
Sarah said, her voice barely audible. This place isn't right. Kevin and I nodded in agreement, but as we began to gather our things, we heard a soft, whispering voice. Help me. We froze, our eyes darting towards the sound. It was coming from the direction of the stream. With our flashlights in hand, we cautiously approached the stream. The whispering grew louder, and we saw a faint, ghostly figure standing by the water. It was a young woman, her eyes filled with sorrow. Who are you? Kevin asked, his voice shaking. The figure's eyes met ours. My name is Abigail. I am searching for my love who never returned. Please help me find him. Sarah swallowed hard. How can we help you? Abigail pointed towards a dense thicket on the other side of the stream. There is a place, a grove, where he used to wait for me. Find it and bring me a token from there. We exchanged nervous glances, but knew we couldn't leave her like this. We carefully crossed the stream and made our way through the thicket. The air grew colder the deeper we went, and an unnatural silence enveloped us. After what felt like hours, we reached a small grove. In the center was a large ancient tree with a heart carved into its trunk. Inside the heart were the initials A plus J. Below it, we found an old locket lying in the grass. We took the locket and made our way back to Abigail. As we handed it to her, tears streamed down her ghostly face. Thank you, she whispered, her voice filled with relief. Now I can find peace. As she spoke, her figure began to fade, and the forest seemed to come alive with a newfound sense of calm. The oppressive feeling lifted, replaced by a peaceful silence. We made our way back to the campsite in silence, too stunned to speak. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we packed up our things and left Whispering Pines, eager to put the experience behind us. In the days and weeks that followed, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We searched for any information about Abigail and the legend of Whispering Pines, but found nothing definitive. It was as if the forest had swallowed up the past and only released a whisper of its secrets. Years later, the memory of that night still lingers. We rarely talk about it, but when we do, we can't help but wonder what truly happened in those dark woods. Did we help a lost soul find peace, or was it all just a strange dream? One thing is certain. Whispering Pines is a place we will never return to. The whispers of the past are best left undisturbed, for some secrets are too haunting to be forgotten. The summer before senior year, my friends Jake, Lily, and I decided to spend a weekend camping at Crystal Cove. It was a hidden gem, a secluded spot surrounded by thick woods and a serene lake, perfect for a weekend of fun and relaxation. Little did we know, our trip would turn into a chilling encounter that would haunt us forever. We arrived at Crystal Cove on a warm Friday afternoon. The lake's clear waters sparkled in the sunlight, and the forest seemed to welcome us with its calming rustle. We set up our tents near the lake's edge, excited for the adventures ahead. Jake suggested we explore the area, so we set off along a trail that circled the lake. As we walked, we noticed the remnants of old campsites and abandoned cabins, adding a sense of mystery to the otherwise beautiful surroundings. We returned to our site as the sun began to set, the sky painted with hues of orange and pink. That night, we built a campfire and sat around it, roasting hot dogs and making s'mores. Jake, always the comedian, shared a funny story about a bear that loved stealing campers' snacks. Okay, enough of the jokes, Lily said, still laughing. Have you heard about the ghost of Crystal Cove? Jake and I leaned in curious. No. What's the story? I asked. Lily's face turned serious. They say that years ago, a young couple drowned in the lake. The girl Emily is said to haunt the cove, 
searching for her lost love. Campers have reported seeing her ghostly figure near the water, especially on nights like this. A chill ran down my spine. That's creepy, I said, glancing nervously at the dark lake. Jake shrugged, trying to sound brave. Just a story, right? Nothing to worry about. But as the night wore on and the fire began to die down, we heard a soft, mournful cry. It sounded like someone was calling out from the lake. Did you hear that? Lily whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Jake nodded, his usual confidence gone. Yeah, what do you think it is? The next morning, we woke up to find strange, wet footprints leading from the lake to our campsite. They were small, like those of a young woman, and they stopped abruptly near our tents. This is really weird, I said, my voice trembling. Who would do this? Lily shook her head. I don't know, but I don't like it. We decided to spend the day hiking, hoping to shake off the unease from the night before. As we explored the forest, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. The beauty of Crystal Cove now felt eerie and unsettling. That night, we built the fire higher and sat closer together. We tried to laugh and tell jokes, but the eerie atmosphere made it difficult to relax. Around midnight, we heard the cry again, louder this time. I think we should leave, Lily said, her voice barely audible. This place isn't right. Jake and I nodded in agreement, but as we began to gather our things, we heard a soft, whispering voice. Help me. We froze, our eyes darting towards the sound. It was coming from the direction of the lake. With our flashlights in hand, we cautiously approached the lake. The whispering grew louder, and we saw a faint, ghostly figure standing by the water. It was a young woman, her eyes filled with sorrow. Who are you? Jake asked, his voice shaking. The figure's eyes met ours. My name is Emily. I am searching for my love who drowned here. Please help me find him. Lily swallowed hard. How can we help you? Emily pointed towards a small, overgrown path leading into the woods. There is a place, a hidden cave by the lake, where he drowned. Find it and bring me something that belonged to him. We exchanged nervous glances but knew we couldn't leave her like this. We carefully followed the path, which led us to a hidden cave partially submerged in the lake. The entrance was covered in moss and it looked like it hadn't been disturbed in years. Inside, we found a rusted old locket lying on a rock. We took it and made our way back to Emily. As we handed it to her, tears streamed down her ghostly face. Thank you, she whispered, her voice filled with relief. Now I can find peace. As she spoke, her figure began to fade, and the oppressive feeling that had surrounded us lifted. The forest seemed to breathe a sigh of relief, and the air felt lighter. We made our way back to the campsite in silence, too stunned to speak. As the first light of dawn broke through the trees, we packed up our things and left Crystal Cove, eager to put the experience behind us. In the days and weeks that followed, we tried to make sense of what had happened. We searched for any information about Emily and the legend of Crystal Cove but found nothing definitive. It was as if the lake had swallowed up the past and only released a whisper of its secrets. Years later, the memory of that night still lingers. We rarely talk about it, but when we do, we can't help but wonder what truly happened in those dark woods. Did we help a lost soul find peace? Or was it all just a strange dream? One thing is certain. Crystal Cove is a place we will never return to. The whispers of the past are best left undisturbed, for some secrets are too haunting to be forgotten. Thank you for joining me tonight on The Haunting Hour. If these stories sent shivers down your spine, don't forget to hit that like button. 
It helps me bring more chilling tales straight to your screen. If you're not yet part of our ghostly gathering, click subscribe and ring the bell to not miss out on any of our haunted adventures. And I'm curious, which story tonight creeped you out the most? Drop a comment below to let us know. Your favorite stories fuel our dark fires and inspire more spooky tales. Also, what kind of scary stories do you want to hear next? Tell me in the comments. Your wish might just become our next nightmare. Until next time, keep the lights on and keep the spirits at bay. Good night, and remember, never venture alone into the dark.